Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie, and this is The Reason Podcast. Please subscribe to us at iTunes and rate and review us while you're there. Today, we're talking with Ray Lehman. He's a senior fellow at R Street, and he's also the co-founder of R Street, which is a public policy think tank that uh, talks about environmental and other kinds of policy issues. Ray Lehman, thanks for talking. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we're talking about Hurricane Harvey, which has uh, slammed Houston and is actually taking on other parts of the uh, the Gulf Co- Coast right now. One of the things that we're hearing a lot, uh, and this has certainly got to be the most politicized hurricane you know in history, even more than uh, than Katrina as it's unfolding. But we're hearing that Hurricane Harvey, uh, and especially the damage in Houston, is evidence of climate change. Uh, the L.A. Times, this is a representative headline. Uh, where uh, in a House editorial they said Harvey should be a warning to Trump that climate change is a global threat. Uh, is that the right way to be talking about Hurricane Harvey and and especially the damage in Houston? It's uh, it's not that obviously climate, we believe climate change is a global threat. Um, whether any particular storm can be attributed to climate change is uh, that's more controversial. Um, it's not. It's not entirely clear that uh, climate change in and of itself would change uh, hurricane patterns in this way. Uh, there's various impacts that climate change could have on hurricanes. Um, sort of general consensus is that climate that warmer sea temperatures will drive more powerful storms. Um, there's mixed opinion on whether they will cause more frequent storms, and there's pretty much consensus, at least in the Atlantic Basin that the long-term effects of climate change would actually be to make fewer storms make U.S. landfall uh, because the the trade winds are going to be weakening. So fewer storms are going to get that northeast lift, take them off the Caribbean and into the United States. Unfortunately, that means they'll mostly be hitting Latin America where they don't have the same resources we do to recover. Um, So what you can say, yeah, yeah, that's a problem. (laughs) What you can say for sure is that the sea level rise is a threat uh, it, that has already happened, and uh, there are other causes of sea level rise beyond just climate change, um, all of which uh, contribute both in this storm and in, in flood, flood uh, risks more generally. What, what are the other uh, uh, causes of uh, sea level change? Because, and and, I, and I'm, I'm working at this from a layman's perspective, but, I mean, you, uh, you uh, uh, like reason, believes that uh, you know, climate change is happening, that temperatures are warming, and that human activity has at least something to do with that. Um, But then if it's not just, you know, the polar ice caps melting and uh, whatnot, what is uh, what's causing sea level rise? If you go down to southern Louisiana, it is uh, erosion, uh, soil erosion in general, um, which uh, or land, what you would call land subsidence, which is the land falling as much as the sea rising. Um, so that that's happening in a number of areas, including here. I live in Florida, uh, <laughs> and where that, that's happening even without uh, change in the absolute level of the sea. Um, in Louisiana, actually, one of the major, not major, but contributing causes is uh, the nutria rat uh, eating away at a bunch of uh, vegetation, and that causing greater erosion. Um, so there there are other definitely other uh, causes besides just climate change that that are relevant in these in these contexts so is there you know it and uh, to go back to this uh, question of the effects of climate change on the number and intensity of storms is there yet i mean there's a lot of theory out there but is there yet evidence that uh, because you also hear this that you know get used to this there are going to be more hurricanes there are going to be more big storms right. and they're going to be more intense and you're saying the evidence on that is uh, a little bit mixed or ambivalent right now yeah, I mean, the truth is we just came off a dozen years without a major uh, hurricane making landfall in the United States. Uh, there had not been one since 2005. Sandy was a very large storm, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't even a hurricane uh, when it made landfall. Um, it, was, uh, it was a tropical storm, just a, a physically enormous one. Um, you had Hurricane Ike, and that was a two, and last year you had a couple ones, but there hadn't been a three or larger is a major hurricane. Mm-hmm. Uh, but each big storm, uh, you know, and I guess whether it's a tropical storm or a hurricane and what category of hurricane varies, but it seems that each big storm sets damage records. And that's often kind mm-hmm. of, you know, that's that kind of gets equated with, well, the storms are more powerful, they're more dangerous. But is the damage record, is that mostly because more people are living 
living near places uh, like are living on the coasts or in areas that are at risk or, you know, so is it really a weather problem or is it a kind of a location and demographic problem? It is primarily a people problem. I, I, as I mentioned, I live in Florida. It is a low-lying peninsula that jets out into the most hurricane-prone region in the world. If you go back to the World War II, Florida was the smallest, least populated state in the South, and it is now the third largest state in the country. Um, now, more than half the U.S. population now lives in coastal counties. That's, uh, that was up about 45% over uh, the decades from, like, 1970 to, to 2010. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a great journal piece in uh, uh, Nature back in 2013, and they, they projected the global flood losses uh, would, by 2050, rise to about $60 billion. So that's about 10 times uh, what they have been, which is about six billion dollars. But if uh, there was no, if you did not in, include the impacts of climate change or sea level rise at all, it would still be expected to rise to about fifty billion dollars just from economic development and growth in coastal populations. Well, uh, and Houston is like that. Uh, in 1950, Houston only had about 600,000 people, I think, something like that. And it's now got about 2.3 million people. It's uh, nipping at the heels of Chicago to become the third largest city in the country. Uh, and then the metro area itself, or the larger county, is big as well. Um, you know, so it's it's clear that like if if a hurricane hits a big storm hits in Houston now it's going to affect m magnitudes of order more people than it would have 50 years ago or 40 years ago property other things that i've read that say that attribute to the ferocity of the storm there though is that the amount of pavement and developed surfaces around Houston is just gigantic because the more people you have the more roads you have the more houses you have the more buildings um is that, uh, you know, and that all makes it harder for water to uh, dissipate. Is that, uh, you know, is that sort of development a contributing factor to the effects of these storms? You can't say it's not a contributing factor. I mean, it's, it's certainly beyond just the fact that there are more people, um, more surface area, uh, making it more difficult for groundwater to be absorbed is, uh, is definitely contributes to the size of the flood. Um, you know, the thing that people have been bringing up specifically is noting that Houston doesn't have zoning, right? But zoning, if you look uh, nationwide, the, the actual impact of zoning tends to be to, have, to fight uh, dense uh, dense housing as opposed to encouraging it. Like if, if everyone in Houston lived in the kinds of high rises they live in, in San Francisco or New York city or Chicago, um, then theoretically you'd, you could have that same size city with less, uh, covered space, more open land. Um, but you can't assume that that's what a zoning board in, in Houston would do. Right? That's not how zoning boards usually act. People don't like density. Um, and and the, when you give governments uh, power to control land use like that, they usually uh, act in the opposite direction, which is where the politics are. So, I mean, I think what you can say is that, like, there are probably flood mitigation measures that they could still take. Uh, there, I know there are two major reservoirs that beat back to, like, the 40s, um, and they've held up pretty well. Uh, given the intensity of this storm, but they probably could use some updating. Um, the, the Army Corps might want to look at that. And uh, when it comes to, like, stormwater runoff, um, they, they, maybe they're, they're, they're not they're, – the market on its own may not be uh, pricing the externality of that appropriately. There's actually an interesting system in D.C. Uh, in D.C. itself, they have something like a cap-and-trade system for stormwater, uh, where if you – if you're downtown and it's really expensive to to treat stormwater runoff, you can buy credits from people, you know, up in uh, Cleveland Park or whatever to uh, to to get your share of the of the runoff uh, through their properties. Um, and that that's a thing, you know, either like a a tax on on total paving or that sort of thing that might be a way to to move it in a in a more flood friendly direction, but.
um, I don't think you can say it's, it's zoning or development yeah. in and of itself. Well, and, and you know, zoning, it's uh, as Houston climbs the list of like the most populated cities, the most popular cities in the country, uh, zoning keeps coming up. You know, that's why it's so ugly. That's why it has no character. That's why it has flooding. Uh, you know, and it's odd for a city that is almost universally rebuked by, you know, kind of uh, zoning czars and land use planners and aesthetic, you know, kind of architects. It, it seems to be quite popular, uh, popular enough that more people keep moving there. So it's, it's strange. And yeah, the whole notion that zoning somehow is, you know, the, the thing that separates us from the animals is kind of bizarre, <laughs> uh, to say the least. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, you, yeah. you, you have talked about um, that, you know, right near uh, Houston and actually in this, uh, in this storm, uh, there is an alternative to a story that's not really being talked a lot about that has to do with Port Aransas. Uh, tell me about what, what is going on there and why that uh, kind of is a counterexample of how uh, we might mitigate seriously mitigate the effects of of extreme weather right so one thing that's interesting about this is that uh it's not actually the case that you, that you should conceive of the damage we're going to see from harvey as primarily hurricane damage because it it sat over houston for all these days as a tropical storm or even a subtropical storm so it, all the flooding was not done by a hurricane. It was done by just a, a massive and unprecedented amount of water. It was a hurricane when it landed. It was a Category 4. There's only been a few Category 4s we've ever had. Um, and it landed uh, near Port Aransas, which is just north of Corpus Christi. Uh, and you certainly saw and damage Corpus, there, Corpus right? Christi is a few hours south down the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico right, yeah. coast from, yeah. uh, from Galveston and Houston. From Houston. Yeah. yeah, from right, exactly. Um, you definitely saw damage there. We're gonna, the, you know, the early the insurance modeling firms that that do this kind of thing expect about two billion dollars in in wind damages there. Um, but for a Category Four storm hitting, you know, a coastal region, that's actually remarkably low. Um, and the reason it's remarkably low is there's not much development there. And there's a good reason there's not much development there, which is that area is part of what's called the Coastal Barrier Resources System. Uh, which was set up in the early 80s. It was a Republican proposal. It came from John Chafee of Rhode Island. Uh, it was signed by President Reagan. And what the Coastal Barrier Resources Act does is any land within this zone of 273 million acres, if you put them together, they'd be like the third largest national park in the country. Um, any development in that area, you're free as a private citizen to invest your own money. What you can't get is federal subsidies. Uh, there's no federal highways, there's no federal public housing, you're not eligible for flood insurance in this zone of barrier islands and coastal wetlands uh, that, you know, as, that were undeveloped as of the early 80s. Um, and they've mostly stayed underdeveloped because people, developers don't want to do it. They don't want to invest if they can't get the subsidies. Uh, and that's pretty key to, to our resilience from these sorts of storms because barrier islands serve... Uh, the purpose of being a buffer. Um, they absorb a lot of water. They can flood. Uh, they can be underwater for, for some period of time. Uh, we saw in places where barrier islands are developed, uh, say the Jersey Shore in Hurricane Sandy, you know, uh, the difference between uh, they're right next to each other, but uh, Island Beach State Park and Seaside Heights. Um, Seaside Heights is is just north of Island Beach State Park. Island Beach State Park is as a, is part of the Coastal Barrier Resources System. Uh, it serves its function of absorbing water. Uh, Seaside Heights is where Snooky goes, and uh, it it served its function of getting knocked to hell uh, when Sandy came through. Well, yeah, t you know, it's funny when you you talked about the uh, you know the shift towards people living in coastal counties and whatnot. I, I like you grew up in New Jersey. Uh, a, a painful number of years ago, but I can remember even in the 70s where I, I grew up in Monmouth County by Sandy Hook, which is the first ocean beach. Uh, you know, it's, it's about 30 miles or 35 miles north of Seaside Heights. And, um, you know, I always felt kind of bad for, I mean, it was common, like the people who lived by the beach tended to have lower income jobs. They were blue collar workers. I mean, it was kind of a hard scrabble existence. And within, you know, 10, 20 years, all of a sudden, you know, every Everybody wanted to live in on the beach and and similar in California even I lived in LA and Santa Monica 
uh, during the course of the late 60s and 70s went from a kind of sleepy working class town to a playpen for, uh, you know, Hollywood royalty is, you know, wh- how much did federal policy or state policies kind of change to make the, the kind of beach or the shore more attractive for people to live there? I mean, was it that they, you know, a bunch of policies went into place that helped soak up all of these high costs that people wouldn't really be able to, wouldn't be willing to pay out of pocket? So in 1968, we created the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, Prior to that, uh, there really wasn't very much uh, insurance coverage for floods. Um, there, uh, there had been some market in like the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, there was a series of Mississippi River floods in like the 20s that kind of ended that. Um, and after that, it became very difficult to get insurance coverage for floods. Some of that is uh, things that are sort of accidents of the history of the insurance market in the United States. It's always been state regulated, um, and so historically, most insurance companies were local. Uh, we didn't have uh, the national companies that you do now um, back then. And so local companies would face extreme, unlike a fire, which is a fortuitous thing, uh, it tends to only affect one property at a time, maybe two or three if the major blaze, a flood can destroy an entire city. Um, so insurance companies didn't, who that were local didn't want to be exposed like that. The reinsurance market, which is insurance for insurance companies, wasn't yet as developed as it is now. Uh, and so you couldn't, didn't have very much uh, private flood insurance. In the 60s, we created the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, which extended uh, underpriced flood insurance uh, offered by the federal government to pretty much everyone. It's any community that wanted to participate uh, and met certain basic standards. It, the original idea was that it was going to encourage communities to invest in flood mitigation. I think it did a little bit of that early on, uh, but it has not really served that purpose of the long run. It served the purpose of making it possible to live in places people never lived before, because now you have a mechanism to to uh, bail you out once things go wrong. Uh, the state of Florida, for sure, was built on the National Flood Insurance Program. It's about one-third of uh, National Flood Insurance Program policies are here in Florida. Wow. And, uh, you know, is there any... Uh is is there any movement to restrict that um, or or to peel it back? I mean, it sounds like farm subsidies uh, in a way where, you know, and it, it's obviously it's not the only reason people flock to the water. Uh, you know, it's also true that, you know, construction methods get better. Yeah. You know, people like the water and the weather and all of that. But it's but it's a contributing factor. And it's certainly one that's under our control. Um, is there any sense that, you know, this these are policies that can't stand and why the hell are people who live in either parched areas of the country or places not prone to flooding are bailing out, you know, uh, people who tend to be wealthier living on Long Island, living on the Jersey Shore, living in Florida? So back in 2012, we had a bill uh, called the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act um, that passed and was signed by President Obama. And Bigger Waters took uh, those policies that were not paying appropriate rates and put them on a path to gradually see their rates increase. Um, then, just about immediately after that bill passed, you started getting uh, scare stories um, that were distributed uh, with the help of uh, FEMA by not by not responding to them. Uh, Serve the interest of home builders and realtors uh, who did not like that this was going to have an impact on housing markets. Um, and people uh, were told that their rates might increase to $20,000, $30,000, dollars uh, There was no evidence of this, um, the, just none at all. But FEMA did not really do anything to, uh, to provide clarity. Um, and in the middle of that hysteria, we then got a second bill in 2014 uh, called the Grim Waters Act, which is, I think, appropriately named. Um, also appropriate that Maxine Waters, who uh, co-sponsored the original bill, was then on the second bill that largely repealed uh, the Bigger Waters Act, or at least it, it slowed it down enormously. Um, and that was unfortunate. Now, it's, it's still the case that over the long term, uh, 
these properties are seeing rate increases. They're pretty modest, and we will get to a point eventually where they're paying what they should. Um, and there's also encouraging signs that we're getting a private flood insurance market. It's it's still new. It's not very large. It's not yet enough to take over completely, but it's building, and we'll get there. Um, there is legislation right now. You know, the flood insurance program's authorization expires at the end of September. There's legislation right now that passed uh, through the House Financial Services Committee a couple months ago that would help uh, with some of the some of the key questions on private flood insurance, like if you have a mortgage, does the private flood insurance count? What kind of private flood insurance do you need uh, that would be equivalent to the NFIP? There's also rules like currently the NFIP policies are sold by private insurance agents um, who are usually affiliated with with insurance companies. If you are an insurance company that takes part in that uh, what's called the Write Your Own program, then you are not permitted to write private flood insurance. Uh, so that's another that's another rule that would change in the in the House bill, um, and also just like getting the data uh, available from FEMA to the private market about flood losses and and underwriting. Uh, all of that, I think, we will push forward towards a uh, a more robust private market that will hopefully more appropriately price. Right. And, uh, and the goal of that is just that, you know, to the extent that insurance is seen or is a uh, risk management tool, we'll get a fairer pricing of the, the costs and benefits of, of living in, uh, you know, in areas that are prone to extreme weather. And if, and if that happens, then uh, there are projects that might otherwise take place if they're subsidized by the government that won't take place, as, as you see in the Coastal Barrier Resources System. Um, because if you have to pay your full freight, if you have to take account of what the real risks are, then you're going to adjust your, at the margin, you're going to adjust your behavior, um, which doesn't mean no one lives at the coast. Like that, which that's, that's sort of how the command and control environmental movement would approach this. There, there are efficient ways to live at the coast. There are efficient losses to take. Um, but at the same time, we don't want this to be on the backs of taxpayers. So what are some other policies that would mitigate, you know, that and, uh, you know, uh, kind of mitigate the effects of, you know, say of hurricanes, of, of extreme weather, of floods that, um, you know, that we should be pursuing and that we should be talking about rather than, you know, arguing over whether or not Melania Trump should have worn stilettos or sneakers, you know, when she was leaving right. to visit uh, Houston. <laughs> Right. So like Shakespeare said, first kill all the lawyers, I, I say first kill all the subsidies, um, then we can move on to, to stage two. Um, there, I think, you know, uh, libertarians will differ on the degree to which they think a lot of things are government responsibilities. I'm more or less okay with things like levies and other public construction. I'd like to see more things done at the local level uh, where, where they can be more responsive, but I think that those are appropriate infrastructure projects to help protect communities. Uh, I think you can have some degree of land use planning where it's things like, uh, for instance, if you're going to if, if you have a repetitive loss property and the government's going to buy it out um, and move this person somewhere else, say, okay, we, you've, you've flooded too much you've, or you've suffered whatever sort of disaster too frequently, we're going to buy you out and move you somewhere else, then maybe you don't allow people to build there anymore <laughs> once that money has been spent. Otherwise, you're sort of creating, yeah, you're creating an incentive to just keep, keep moving in and then taking the buyout. Is there, um, is, does that happen frequently? Uh, I seem to re recall uh, somewhat dimly uh, stories about like whole towns on the Mississippi kind of getting bought out or people being relocated. There, there are two programs within FEMA. One is within the flood insurance program and one is uh, just disaster mitigation in general that do have authority to do buyouts. Um, in the National Flood Insurance Program, it was back in 2004, they, uh, Congress passed this bill um, Bunning, I can't even remember the names of the, it was Jim Bunning and, and, uh, Bloom, and Earl Blumenauer were two of the sponsors, um, that you were, it was, the, the intent was that if you had three losses, uh, then you would be, per, you, you would be bought out. Um, you would either have to raise your home or be bought out. Uh, but I don't think they ever funded it. 
uh, and so lacking any funding, it never really happened. There, so there's a there's a limited number of buyouts that happen through FEMA, but it's not not terribly much. What about on a, a you know, and I'm thinking three, uh, and especially Jim Bunning, a, a Hall of Fame baseball pitcher, you would think it'd be three strikes and you're out, like you get nothing. You uh, you 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 uh, you are now officially owned by the government or something. Of That's course, you were, that that was the name of the bill. Oh, I see. <laughs> three strikes, three and, strike, then, and you are out of the national flood insurance program. I thought it was like three strikes, <laughs> and we bring uh, we bring out the T, and you just keep hitting until you get right, on, right. until you get on base. <laughs> But um, right, exactly. what uh, what about on a global level? Um, what are what are your preferred ways to deal with uh, climate change? Because, you know, and it seems to me there are within the broader libertarian community or the, the broadly defined uh, libertarian community, there are some people who still say, you know, what global warming does isn't happening or, you know, it happens all the time and we have nothing to do with it. And so, you know, why talk about it at all? Most people I know who are libertarians say, you know what, climate change is happening, it's observable, uh, human activity is contributing to it. Uh, and then, you know, what do you do next? And one of the things that I find very attractive is the idea that, well, you know, to the extent if, I mean, if we go with like a massive pro- global program that slows down economic innovation and economic activity, suddenly instead of living in South Florida, we're living in Bangladesh, and we have less fewer resources to kind of uh, be resilient and to build better buildings uh, and come back from weather events. Is that kind of your approach to global warming? Or what are the ways that we should deal with uh, climate change, uh, you know, as a planet? What we would certainly agree with is we think uh, the greatest uh, response to climate change is to be wealthy um, and to have the resources to be able to deal with the effects, which are still largely unknown, right? You, you can't, can't know what you're going to need to do, but having, having more money always helps. Uh, we also, uh, we're not, this is not a secret, we support a, a carbon tax, uh, a one that does not in any way raise taxes. In fact, we, we have proposed replacing the corporate income tax entirely with a carbon tax. Um, carbon tax, we will fully admit, does not actually reverse global warming. Uh, it may help at the margin, um, but it is unlikely to, to mean that we have no uh, effects. We're going to have effects that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, but if you do it in the right way, if you deregulate, um, you, you use this to get rid of the existing regulatory structure and to zero out uh, a tax that is more destructive to capital. We think that you can still grow and still be prosperous and uh, at the margin, uh, you know, control some of the worst effects. So uh, in in your uh, in our streets kind of plan for uh, uh, slowing carbon emissions, it would be I mean, you tax everybody who is uh, emitting carbon. Uh, you raise the price of carbon so you get less of it. That's the plan. Um, and then what, but you, do you earmark that? Ta- I mean, the, the purpose of the tax then is to shut down carbon emissions or to lower that in the, uh, in the hope or in the idea that it will on some level help mitigate, uh, you know, uh, climate change. Um, what, what happens to that money? Does that just go into a general revenue stream? Um, or does it get earmarked or does it, you know, what, what happens? There's a lot of proposals, um, that have come forward by a lot of different people. You know, Al Gore wants to use it to uh, offset the payroll tax. There's others who come up with uh, what they call a tax and dividend system, which essentially means you you apply the tax and then you give it back to people, um, presumably based on their income. We we have proposed using it to replace the corporate income tax. Uh, And what we think is an advantage of that is, Replacing the corporate income tax actually raises some money in and of itself. Uh, if you just repealed it because of how inefficient it is, um, and so that helps take care of some of the problem. Because if you raise, it, if you got rid of the corporate income tax, then those uh, a good portion of that income would instead be earned by corporate CEOs uh, or shareholders uh, through dividends and and through capital gains, and you could capture the money that way at the individual level. Um, I think it's always going to be the case that corporations will have more lobbying power than people. And so anytime you create a new corporate tax, anytime you try tax reform, it does not take very long for that to get mucked up with all sorts of exemptions and and special treatment. 
get rid of the corporate tax, use this tax instead. How do you uh, how do you levy a carbon tax? Like how do you how do you identify the how do you identify the sources and then say okay, you owe you know this much, you owe that much. Right. So the generally you want to do it as close to the source as possible at the at the level of either say the refiner if you're talking about motor fuels or at the level of you know the generator um, if you're talking about electricity. Um, there are other sources of carbon, other sources of greenhouse gases. Smarter people than I could tell you the most efficient way to to, to deal with them, but the, that's the broad strokes of it. But essentially, it would be like putting a meter on devices that produce carbon. So you know, it's kind of like an electric meter, an elect, uh, you know, something or a gas meter, or something like that. Right. Yeah. And you want to you want it you want it as far from the consumer as possible. You don't want it to be like at the pump the way a gas tax is. Um, because you're the the closer the further down the stream it is, first of all, the the more chances that it's going to get multiplied, um, and also that you change behavior in ways that are inefficient. Do you worry at all? Uh, in in I mean, it almost sounds the way you're talking about it that you see the carbon tax as almost the way of buying off environmentalists, especially <laughs> if it's not going to have a profound <laughs> impact. It's more like okay, here's a way that we can shut them up for a while and get rid of. The capital or uh, the corporate tax, which virtually even even a lot of progressive economists will say, is almost completely a stupid tax. It doesn't raise as much money as it should because of lobbying power, and it just gets in the way of business development. I think we uh, that's not unfair uh, as a characterization. If you go back to the uh, the Waxman Markey bill, uh, the cap and trade bill, um, they wanted to do the same thing. Uh, it was just with their own priorities. They wanted to use cap and trade uh, to raise some money, you know, spend it on solar projects and other things that were important to their base and their donors. Um, and so cap and the climate change was the issue, but cap and trade was the mechanism to get other things they wanted done. Well, there's other things we want done, and we think we can use this to, to get those things done. All right. Well, I uh, as long as we're keeping dry, as a, a last question, um, you know, yeah. we have had uh, at least each of the previous two presidents, uh, George Bush with Katrina, which was, you know, uh, his response. And he certainly was not the only major political figure in, you know, going back to the governor of Louisiana, as well as the mayor of New Orleans. They all handled Katrina very poorly. Uh, uh, Barack Obama you know, uh, it's not clear to me, I think, or a lot of people, whether or not Sandy was, uh, you know, was his finest hour, but also the uh, the oil, uh, the oil spill in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, where he talked about he was going to go looking for asses to kick in his administration, uh, because the the federal response was terrible uh, to it. What what is the what's the essential thing? And it's not to, you know, what what does Donald Trump as president need to do to kind of break the chain of, you know, kind of bad responses to major, uh, major, you know, breaking kind of environmental events? Uh, so I, I'd say with w- one thing you notice with uh, certainly with uh, George W. Bush and and that is an issue now with uh, with Donald Trump is that at the time of the storm, they were already fairly unpopular. Um, so I think the, from a political perspective, the first thing you should do is no harm. Um, he, uh, Donald Trump would help himself to show more empathy than he has, but otherwise he has a pretty good FEMA director, uh, which is something that you could not have said. It's probably of anybody since James Lee Witt, uh, with, uh, Clinton, uh, Craig Fugate, uh, under Obama was also quite quite competent, but um, it is pretty common for the FEMA director to be some political hack. Uh, and and uh, Director Brock under Trump is a guy who has experience from FEMA, has experience as Alabama's manager during the oil spill. Um, and Texas, Texas, I'd say more than Louisiana, uh, has competent state government, and, and they are going to be able to respond more competently. So Trump should mostly stay out of the way, but but rather than being weatherman uh, and bragging about the size of the storm, I think he'd do himself some some favors to try to show that he's a human being who actually con- is concerned about other human beings. So that may be uh, his toughest challenge yet. Yes. 
Yes. Well, we will leave it there. I want to thank Ray Lehman. He's a senior fellow at R Street, uh, where you can ch- uh, check out rstreet.org. He's also a co-founder. Ray, thanks for talking to us about Houston and uh, the causes and best responses to uh, you know, massive flooding in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Thank you. This has been The Reason Podcast. I'm Nick Gillespie. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to us at iTunes and rate and review us while you're there.